this is a video. <laughs> and um, this is actually, it, it, it was from uh, I-70 on Vail Pass going westbound. And it was, you know, just an average traffic time, not a high volume holiday weekend. And I really wish you could see it because you would see that there is a constant stream of cars and trucks. And that, again, not a high volume period, just an average day in the fall. And there's not anywhere near, when you, when you actually see the video, um, it's like you don't even see a five or a 10 second gap between a car or truck passing by. So it really gives you a sense of what that feels like from that wildlife perspective. So then the question is, you know, of course, what do we do about this? How can we address this? And the first question we have to think about is where? Where are we going to address these issues? Where should we prioritize mitigation? So to help answer that question, CDOT and Colorado Parks and Wildlife joined forces and commissioned um, this series of two studies, first starting on the western slope, and that was completed in 2019, and then looking at the eastern slope and plains, and that study was completed just last year. And combined, these two studies equip CDOT and CPW with the statewide perspective of where to prioritize mitigation on our roadways. And looking at, you know, where are we going to have the biggest effect in reducing collisions and improving safety, um, but also providing connectivity and permeability for wildlife. So here are the results from the Western Slope study. And the red areas are um, the highest priority areas in the region. So this is a very much a regional scale analysis looking at, at this bigger picture. And um, what we see here is that uh, Certainly the northwest corner pops out quite a bit, no surprise there, because that's actually where we have the largest herds of migratory deer and elk in the nation. And we also see some areas um, kind of east of Durango in that area coming out. That was actually, this was that roadway I showed you that uh, movement model from the deer earlier. And, um, and then I pulled out this uh, little clip of like what's going on in the Roaring Fork Valley. And what we see here, again, is that this looking at the regional scale, so not looking at it from a local perspective, but you see some portions um, certainly of 82 and of 133 just um, right outside here. So, um, and Cecily is going to talk about this more, about how, how, how she's looking to use these data and kind of reframe it and reanalyze it in the context of this valley so that we can really prioritize, okay, where do we want to focus our efforts here? So then the next question, after we answer the where, is the how. So for this, um, the main thing here is that uh, wildlife crossings and fencing, we know this is a really effective mitigation measure. We have such great success with this kind of mitigation. Um, it is costly, but we also have um, a, the economic benefits as well as the wildlife and just um, human benefits are um, really worth it. And so um, this is the number one mitigation measure that we can use. But there are other mitigation strategies. And they, they are perhaps less effective. But there, there are some strategies that sometimes we do want to employ, either just to reduce collisions to some degree so that you know, it's better than nothing, or um, in other cases as to be complementary to other mitigation efforts. So doing multiple things together, and we can actually make a dent in the problem. Um, you can see I have this little scale here along the bottom, and mitigation like reflectors, some of you guys have probably seen these, like roadside reflectors, and the idea is that a car passing by, their headlights hit the reflectors, and it creates a visual barrier for wildlife. Um, we know that things like that, deterrence, like light and noise deterrence, they just don't work. So we can save our money on that, move on. Um, we've all seen signs, of course. and. What we found is that the more specific the sign, the more targeted it is, both spatially and temporally, the more effective it can be. So the yellow diamond signs, as soon as you pass those, you've forgotten about it. Um, but if we can get a little bit more of a direct message out, that can be really helpful. So one place I like to put signs, for example, is at a fence end, because there's a good likelihood that wildlife could be moving in that area. Another system is um, what we call an animal detection or driver warning system. And what this consists of is a roadside um, uh, wildlife detection. So usually it's something like a thermal system or a radar detection that actually can detect animals as they approach the roadway. And then it triggers 
these signs. So when those signs are flashing, you know that there's an animal coming up to the roadway. So um, in concept, that's awesome. In reality, um, the technology is not quite there, and it takes a lot of driver learning. We have to teach drivers what to do. So, there's, so I think there's a lot of promise here. In general, um, the, the results have been kind of eh. And, and it's also costly to install those kinds of systems. So we're continuing to try to expand our toolbox. I think that's really important. We always need more things that we can do because we can't always build wildlife crossings and fencing. So here's a little case study um, from State Highway 9. So this is in Grand County between Silverthorne and Kremling. And um, the mitigation objectives here were to reduce wildlife collisions and maintain permeability for wildlife. So this is an area, all this blue area here is mule deer winter range and also for other species as well. And prior to the construction of the mitigation, over 60% of crashes that were reported to law enforcement were wildlife vehicle collisions. So most crashes in this area were due to wildlife and, and driver interactions. And um, they counted 63 of these uh, wildlife vehicle collision carcasses uh, every year on this stretch of roadway. So then post-construction, um, this is kind of what it looks like is this map on the right. And the mitigation consists of this um, 10, nearly 10 and a half mile segment of roadway that has fence on both sides. Uh, two wildlife overpasses, five underpasses, and then uh, mitigation like ramps and, and wildlife guards, and which are kind of like expanded cattle guards, and uh, pedestrian access points, usually for recreation. So this is a little bit of, of a project background here, because um, I think this is really uh, valuable, especially for Play other places that are interested in kind of more community-driven projects and how do we get more of these projects in our areas. And so this is a really good example of that um, from Grand County. This project was spearheaded by the Blue Valley Ranch, which is a local conservation ranch that has a lot of property along that stretch of roadway. And in 2001, they initiated conversations with CDOT um, to talk about, hey, what can we do here? And then those conversations stalled and nothing really happened for a long time. But then in 2010, the ranch re-engaged with CDOT and actually brought nearly a million dollars of funding to the table to help initiate a design process. To, so to figure out um, you know, the whole mitigation concept and then to have those engineering designs. So it gets to a stage that we call shelf ready or shovel ready. But fortunately then, you know, the project didn't have to wait too long um, for construction funding. There was a one-time grant opportunity through CDOT called RAMP, and um, that required a 20% match. And so um, the uh, Blue Valley Ranch, they said, okay, we're gonna issue a challenge grant um, to help get these matching dollars that we need because the whole project was $46 million, so it was for the wildlife mitigation, but also some other roadway improvements. And so the matching component was $9.2 million, so that's a lot of money. So they um, issued this challenge grant, and a local citizens group called the Citizens for a Safe Highway 9, they convened and came together, and they succeeded in raising the rest of this match amount in 45 days um, to meet that grant application deadline. I know, that's, it's almost insane. <laughs> so um, they, you know, they, they were very successful in reaching out to private donors, everything from $5 donors from across the country to you know, really large donors. Um, they also reached out to local governments, towns contributed money, um, Summit County, you know, the project's not in Summit County, but Summit County contributed money because their people drive through there all the time, right? And um, Grand County then met the, the final amount with the 3.1 million to meet the, the rest of it so that they had that match made. And then in, uh, later in 2013, the project was awarded that $36 million uh, in the ramp funds. I mean, when you raise $4.5 million, $9.2 million in, in uh, 45 days, you get the grant. So, I mean, this project, it could not have happened without those partnerships. I just can't stress that enough. Blue Valley Ranch was certainly a leader in that, but not the only one. We also had the Citizens Group. We had CDOT and CPW that really came together in this collaboration, and that was really important for this project and the local community that really backed it. And 
every partnership is going to be unique. They're all going to be a little bit different. They're all going to form a little bit differently. But this model of a partnership and then um, how they were able to really get this project constructed has just served as, a, as a, an important example for other places, not only around Colorado, but across the nation. So do they work? I get to draw on some of my own research here. Um, this is a really fun project to work on. So um, what we see here, these are the post or the pre-construction wildlife vehicle collisions. Each one of those dots um, represents a, a carcass that was counted in the, the four years prior to the construction of the mitigation. So you can see it's kind of like sheet flow across that whole stretch of roadway. There's, car, there's collisions that are happening along the whole stretch of roadway there. And here's what it looks like post-construction. Um, so you can see the fencing and the wildlife crossings. This mitigation reduced collisions by 92%. That's a huge success rate. And you can see there's still a little bit of a problem area, especially at the south, just beyond the south fence end, which tells us that you know, we'd benefit from extending that mitigation a little bit farther to the south. So the other mitigation goal here was to maintain permeability for wildlife because you know, a lot of animals were getting hit on the road, but it was still permeable. Animals were still crossing the road. And they, in the winter, they're making you know, almost daily movements across that roadway. There's the river on one side, and there's forage on the other. So um, there's a lot of movement during those winter months. So our research team, we had cameras out there. And um, over a five-year period, we collected data that showed um, nearly 113,000 mule deer successful passages under or over the roadway using those seven crossing structures. So a lot of mule deer activity. And we also documented a 96% success rate. So that means the vast majority of deer that approached those structures went through them. And the other thing that I like to point out is that the structures were used by bucks and does and fawns. So we had a full representation of demographic groups, which is really important for population level connectivity, not just like some individuals of a population that are using a structure, because that does happen sometimes. Overall, we had 17 species that we documented using these crossing structures. Um, we saw every ungulate species that is present in the area, so elk, moose, white-tailed deer, pronghorn, bighorn sheep. Um, we also had a number of carnivores, and then my personal favorite is these two river otters. And what were they doing in the sagebrush? So another question that people often ask then is, do we build underpasses? Do we build overpasses? And certainly, you know, there's a lot of factors that go into that, certain terrain and construction feasibility and all of those kinds of things. Um, but we had a really cool opportunity with this study to um, look at both of these structures, because we had two overpasses and five underpasses. And what we found is that mule deer um, readily use both structure types. And it really had more to do with where they were in the landscape, where they, you know, whether they use one structure more or another one. We found that elk require more time to adapt to crossing structures. Generally, they take up to like four years. Um, but, and that's very consistent with research from other locations as well. But we also found that that initial preference for an overpass, which has better visibility and is more open, um, that that can be overcome potentially over time as they become more familiar with the crossing structures and learn to use them. We found bighorn sheep really like overpasses, also very consistent with what folks have found in other places. Um, and moose and white-tailed deer really appeared to like those underpasses better. Red fox was a big fan of the overpass. Um, black bear, no surprise, and bobcat and mountain lion, they uh, tended to use the underpasses more. And then this is actually from I-25 south of Castle Rock. But I like to point this out because this is a, what we call a small mammal connectivity feature so that we can also do something for the small fauna who are prey for larger fauna and um, providing cover for them throughout the entire structure so they don't have to just like, you know, be brave and go through a huge clearing. Um, and what we found, I don't think any of my videos are working here, so that's OK. Um, this is a kind of cool video. It's a couple of deer mice. And you can hear the net traffic noise of I-25. Um, but definitely, we've been finding that these animals are using these, these um, cover features. So it's, it's a very easy way to 
just make sure we're addressing all the wildlife in the in an area, not just the big, the big um, charismatic ones. So I'm going to run through a couple of um, recent and upcoming projects and um, just give you a little bit of an idea of what's here going on um, elsewhere in the state. So this was an uh, overpass and an underpass that was um, constructed. This is in that area, again, where I showed you that mule deal movement model on 160 uh, east of Durango. And so this was just constructed last summer, and um, they're already using it. Here's um, a project that is just being completed. This is um, in that area that was, came up as a red hot spot in that prioritization study north of Craig in the northwest corner of the state where we have these huge deer and elk migrations. And so this, is, this particular structure is part of a bigger system of mitigation um, that is going on up there. And here's one that is um, happening close to my backyard. This is, um, it, there's, uh, as mitigation for a bigger transportation project, CDOT is um, building this crossing structure at, on I-70 at Floyd Hill. So, um, or actually it's like at Genesee, pardon me. It's kind of between the Genesee and Lookout exits, if you know that area. And that's a huge collision area on I-70, um, even with those traffic volumes. And elk get hit there a lot. So um, we're excited to be able to put these structures in and, and provide that connectivity for those animals and uh, also just not have those collisions on the roadway. This is another um, structure that's going to get completed later this year. Um, and this one is targeting bighorn sheep. So this is on US 40, um, just before Empire, as you're driving towards Winter Park. And um, this is an area where the road um, bisects the Georgetown herd, which is the largest herd of bighorn sheep in the state. And it's it's an important connectivity area between different subherbs of this bighorn sheep population, and there's a ton of mortality here. This is the biggest mortality area for the Georgetown sheep herd. And so this crossing structure, what else is really cool about it is that CPW last year was able to acquire the land on the south side and add it as an extension to a state wildlife area that it's right there. So that means we get the protected land um, and are able to just kind of conserve that broader corridor. I-25 Greenland, this is part of a, a bigger project. CDOT already constructed five underpasses um, that we're researching in this area between uh, Castle Rock and Monument. Um, and they also want to build one uh, overpass over I-25. So this is a big structure, um, really trying to provide some additional connectivity for the elk herd in this area. And then finally, this one is particularly near and dear to my heart because I've been working on Vail Pass for a long time and um, we're seeing some momentum with this project. But this, is, this was another project that was spearheaded by a community group, um, Summit County Safe Passages. And that group is composed of um, agencies and nonprofit organizations and the counties and the ski areas are involved. We have a whole huge partnership group here. And we were able to conduct, um, well, first we conducted a planning process that was um, sponsored by the Forest Service. Um, and that project identified Eastvale Pass as the number one priority in the county for mitigation. So that's where we focused our efforts then and said, okay, how are we going to get this done? And then uh, Vail Resorts and Arapaho Basin provided some funding to conduct an engineering feasibility study to develop some mitigation concepts. And that's what you see here. So this is the mitigation vision for Vail Pass. And there's already um, five existing bridges underneath the eastbound lanes of Vail Pass. This is where the eastbound and westbound lanes are separated by a wide median. And we want to build these three structures on the westbound lane, so an overpass and two underpasses. And this is going to happen. Um, <laughs> it's going to take some work, but it's going to happen. So I want to turn it over to Cecily now to talk about the Roaring Fork Safe Passages. Hello, um, my name is Cecily D'Angelo, and um, I grew up here in the Valley, and um, my, I would have to say that my, my passion for doing this work uh, dates only a few years back. It, it uh, was ignited when I read 
a New York Times article that highlighted that wildlife structures are incredibly effective. And the other thing that I noted in the article was that it was something that most Americans on each side of the political divide could agree upon. <laughs> and when I realized that like, this is not only something that I thought was inevitable, like growing up in Colorado, I saw so much roadkill. Um, and it was, it was like something that was horrific, but I didn't realize that it was, it was something we could change. And the moment I realized that, that this is a, a very uh, solvable problem, it, it lit a fire in me to do something about this. Um, I then had a baby and it was a pandemic and it took a couple of years for me to get around to, to working on this issue, but my husband and I were behind a car that hit a, a buck and it, it again like struck me uh, that this is, this is an issue, like I, I just watching that animal have the life taken out of it in that manner was so horrific that I, I was very excited to jump into this project. And at the end of the summer was connected with some people in this valley um, who, uh, as most of you probably are familiar with Tom Cardamone and the Watershed Biodiversity Initiative and a few other really passionate citizens who hadn't been fully spearheading this issue, but had laid a lot of the groundwork for the organization that I launched. And through the partnership with the Watershed Biodiversity Initiative, they are the fiscal sponsor for the organization that I launched. And uh, Tom, amongst many other people here, have been wonderful mentors in the process. I, I launched this initiative in September. And, and one thing I want to just note about that is I was confused as I was over the few years that I was aware of this issue. Um, I, I didn't know why there wasn't an organization in the Valley doing like a lot of work on this issue or a government agency that had hired people. And as I got into the work, I realized that it is an incredibly complex issue. You have to bring together many different stakeholders and you have to, to, to garner the, the public support in order to get um, this issue launched. And, and I realized there just was not, there wasn't a government agency in our valley nor a nonprofit that had the amount of time or money to dedicate to this issue. Um, as many of you know, this is, this is a big issue for our valley. Some of these hits have been so horrific that they've made the news. Um, one of the results of not only vehicles, but also development has been uh, large pressures on our elk populations. Uh, depending on the herd, there's been 30 to 50% decreases in our valley. Uh, one of the ways that we can uh, support these populations is by removing the barrier of moving between their winter and summer um, locations or just their daily migrations um, and connect them to the high quality habitat on each side of the road. This is a great way to ensure their, their populations like that will be healthy far into the future. Uh, this is a little graphic of Highway 82 in our uh, watershed, and let's try to knit it back together as best we can. Uh, I get the question a lot, um, why do we need the local advocacy and uh, funding? And I think that Julia touched on this, but I just want to elaborate on we're unique. We, we actually didn't make it into the top 5% of, uh, of prioritized uh, locations in the CDOT study. That being said, many locations in this valley fall just shy of that. Uh, Snowmass Canyon is like at 94%. Um, and so that, that's just one thing to note. It doesn't mean we won't get support from CDOT, but it means that we have to advocate for ourselves even more. Uh, CDOT also has a backlog of projects. So while they are starting to tackle more and more of these wildlife structures and there's federal funding to support them, uh, there's a, like, it, it often gets put into a 10-year work plan where they're already doing work on a road. And if that section of the road needs wildlife mitigation as well, then, then, then the money can be pulled in for that. And they are, they are also selecting some, some key projects our valley probably would be low on that list, and it could be many, many years before we see anything done unless we spearhead it ourselves. Uh, as I just said, when a local community initiates, you're far more likely to get a response from state and, and federal funds. And CDOT has given me a warm, 
not like a two thumbs up, but a warm nod. So just, <laughs> that's been, <laughs> I've been talking to them already, yeah. Um, and a couple uh, additional examples of, uh, and Julia did touch on most of these, of these like really an interesting uh, private-public partnerships. And it's actually not just private-public, it, it's local, it's city, it's, it's county, and then you're matching with the state and, and federal funds. Um, is the Wallace Annenberg uh, Wildlife Crossing in Los Angeles, and they just broke ground on that incredible structure which will connect the mountain lions um, in the Santa Monica Mountains that are now facing a horrible like problem of inbreeding um, to the other populations on the other side of the 101. The Colorado Nine Project, which again is so inspiring to me, I get very emotional when, if you all go home and watch the Colorado Nine videos, they're just like incredible. Um, and uh, Julia's project, which is the East Vale Pass, um, and they are making incredible headway. Um, so just to tell you guys a little bit about where uh, Roaring Fork Safe Passages is in this process, we are fully funded to commence the prioritization study, which will examine both Highway 82 and 133 in the Valley. Uh, we're incredibly lucky to have Julia commencing on that in uh, uh, she'll be commencing on it in March. And that will take a look at the locations in the valley that are not only the worst for vehicle wildlife vehicle collisions, but also where we need to connect these healthy, preserved sections of habitat in our valley that animals can get to. So we want to be able to create the connectivity between, between the, the highest quality habitat we can. As Julia does this project, she's not reinventing the wheel. Um, Tom Cardamone's study with the Watershed Biodiversity Initiative has laid incredible groundwork for us to make really good decisions as we, as we go about this process. Um, the other piece is that we already have the Western Slope Prioritization Plan. And, and really, what Julia will be doing in this process is synthesizing all that to ensure that the locations that float to the top of that list are the right locations, and that they're feasible and um, and, and the, the projects that we want to start with. The next part of this will be uh, taking the top three locations. And when I refer to a location, it's a roughly give or take a five mile stretch of highway. And we will doing, be doing mitigation plans. Um, we're not quite fully funded for this, but I already am in talks with Julia to be able to, to do this project, which hopefully would commence at the end of the summer. Um, as we work on these mitigation plans, it's not in a vacuum. We will be doing it alongside CPW, CDOT, local counties, um, and then any other stakeholders. As you guys can imagine, there, there could be a, a private landowner and speaking to them and ensuring that wherever it is, it would be very feasible, well accepted, and then connecting preserved pieces of land. This can't be a place where like a, a subdivision is gonna be built in the future. So, um, there's a lot of steps that go into ensuring that what we're choosing to mitigate is the correct, the correct piece. Um, we, just to finish up, uh, have some really incredible volunteers that have been, I, I actually don't know what some of the volunteers even look like, so if you guys might be here and I, I don't even know. Um, <laughs> but uh, we've had people join with expertise in um, everything from uh, design to uh, comms and helping me with social media. And someone just wrote my uh, newsletter for me, which is really sweet because it was just too much for me to tackle this week. And um, I just really welcomed people to sign up for the newsletter and there will be many opportunities. Oh, we have had like landscape art architects and city planners and just a really incredible array of people to, to come forward and, and volunteer effort for this. And the second you know, piece of this is gonna be fundraising. So I encourage you to uh, check out our website and um, I'm gonna open it up with uh, any questions. Yeah. Hi, Greg. <laughs> My first wait, wait, wait. question for you is, tell us how much money you need. Oh yeah. To keep going, I wanna know about the okay. fundraising. Okay, so we, so for, to complete the, uh, both the prioritization study and the, a mitigation plan, we're in the like $170,000 range. Yeah. And, and currently we've raised 70 of that. Yeah. Which is pretty impressive in a short time. It's been really short. So this community has really showed up for this. It's, it's amazing.
Okay. Am I on? Yeah. Um, so Julia, I just, I'm interested in hearing that the animals chose underpasses versus overpasses, uh, or at least you saw, you know, some sort of indication that some species liked one more or the other. Can we talk about the height of the underpasses? Because I think a small cramped underpass like the one near me in Brush Creek Village just simply doesn't work because it's just way too small. I, don't, I can't imagine anybody but a mouse wanting that one. So, or a black bear. Or a black, maybe a black bear. So the thing is, do we know how big it has to be to qualify as a, an underpass that's going to work? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so the, those, those underpasses were all the same size. They were 14 feet high by 42 feet wide and 66 feet long. So we know a couple things. We know that length is a really critical dimension because you're going through a tunnel. And so the shorter that tunnel, the better for most species, definitely for our ungulate species, so for deer and elk and all those guys. Um, we also know that you know, width and kind of, again, for, I'm talking sort of from that deer and elk perspective, width is also really important. So kind of, I like to think about it like width at eye level of, an, of a deer or an elk not my eye level, and um, kind of think about, okay, how does that feel? So it's a feel of openness, like how, you know, do you feel safe going through this structure? If it's a long, dark, narrow, short tunnel, they're not going to go through it. Or maybe very occasionally you'll have an animal, but it's not, you're not going to have herd level movements, or like I was saying before, getting all members of a, uh, of a population through a structure. So height is also important. I would say, uh, you know, if I had to rank the, the, the dimensions, I'd probably put that at the bottom of the list. But there is a minimum height. If it's something is too short, then it's not going to get used. So for, for deer, I mean, I have seen them go through s smaller structures, but um, you know, I try to like get deer a, a, a structure for deer at least feet, ten feet ideally. Um, but you know, sometimes you can't have ideal because I don't know terrain, geology, all those kinds of things that get in your way, and um, and you have you have. There's definitely compromises you have to make sometimes, and then you have to decide, is it worth it? Because we don't want to build structures that aren't effective, because that's obviously a waste of money and does no good to the field at all. So um, it's very much a it depends answer, but I hope that helps a little bit. Great, thank you. Cool. Well, actually, have you seen there is where they don't work, the underpasses or the overpasses don't work, I mean, other than just the not the right size? Yeah, I mean, location is also really important, um, getting them in the right place. So, um, and, and we also want to think about the fact that these are structures we're building that have lifespans of 75 years or more. And so we want them to work for a really long time. And, you know, obviously we don't have a crystal ball and know exactly what's going to happen. But we do try to think in terms of, um, you mentioned this in terms of the protected land on either side. So that's really critical. Um, if, if there's going to be, you know, a, a development or something on one side, we, we definitely want to avoid that. That would be a waste. Um, but, you know, also trying to think about just the habitat and that it's, you know, good, functional, usable habitat for these species. So the data, like that collar data that we were showing you, that, you know, where the animals are telling you where they're going and where they're going the most, um, we really try to focus on things like that. Um, there are examples of crossing structures who have built, that have been built here in Colorado that don't work. And um, these are generally, you know, again, this is an evolving field. So, but there's structures, you know, that were required to be built, for example, for Canada lynx mitigation because it's a threatened species. And so they checked the box, they built a box, literally, and, um, and there's no, nobody's using it, you know. So, so there's definitely, and, and some of that is because there's no fencing associated with it. Some of it, it was a, wasn't appropriate for that species or really much of anything. And so that design, the location, and then again, you know, we think, a lot of times fencing is bad, but when it's fencing and crossing structures, we need that fencing because it guides them, and then they learn where their, those crossing structures are, and they teach their young. Um, they leave scent markings, and other animals follow it as well. So all of that is really critical. I'm going to try to do this in a strategic manner, <laughs> so I'll start at this side of the room. Thanks. Um, so I, I'm, I'm particularly curious about the, uh, and I think this is a question for either of you, I think, but. Um, you know, raising $4 million in 45 days is, is something that's quite unheard of, I think, in, in most philanthropic endeavors. And for most of us in this room, you know, we're, we're both practically minded and also a little sentimental, of course, about wildlife. So I think we might say, well, sure, we'll, we'll donate to that. But I'm curious, how, what was the most effective messaging for the fundraising organizations that you 
saw raise that much money in such a short period of time? What was it that was so successful in convincing these places to donate? Um, the first dollars are the hardest dollars to raise. It's um, so, you know, like they raised four million in 45 days, but that was like 15 years before that. So um, it was definitely a long thing. We're seeing the same thing on Eastvale Pass. You know, people have been talking about Eastvale Pass for almost two decades. And, but once you get that ball rolling, so once you kind of, I don't know, and there's different ways to get there, so it's a little bit hard to answer your question, but once you can get that ball rolling, I think that messaging becomes much easier because then you can say, hey, this is going to happen and we need your money this much on this time frame. And then that gives a very specific goal. Um, and especially because you have this grant, you know, like, hey, if you give this, we get that. It leverages so much more money than, you know, what any individual is giving. So I think all of that is part of the message. I mean, of course, the value uh, and the benefits to wildlife and to humans, you know, that's a given. But I think really just kind of that, that progression of a project is, is really crucial to that tipping point. You want to add to that? Sure. Um, yeah, and I would say that that uh, the approach I'm taking with Roaring Fork Safe Passages is a, it would be really cool if we got like a big matching grant uh, or match challenge, but the it, currently I'm raising it all incrementally and we will see at what point we get larger funds from, and we'll go after like CDOT and uh, federal funds. There is like, and, and I know we've alluded to this, but there's, $350 million in the transportation bill at the federal level now. So some of this has changed the game completely and that those funds are just now being uh, given out as of like the first of the year, correct? Or not even yet? No. <laughs> okay. So, and there'll be, uh, I think that's over four, the next four years, there will be some federal money available specifically for wildlife crossings. Hands up so I can remember. I'm just curious to know if you have any data on the fencing that was placed along I 70 from Garfield County West, if it has had any effect um, in directing animals to the corridors in the last couple years, because that fencing went up what? two or three years ago. Um, so just, I was wondering if you had any data on that piece. Um, I don't. Um, however, I, I, two things. One is um, I bet that wildlife vehicle collisions have decreased. Um, I'm pretty confident in that, though I have not looked at the data myself. Um, and secondly, that there's, they put up that fencing and there are no wildlife crossing structures in there. That's not to say that there's no structures at all. There's some culverts, you know, there's some things, there's some bridges that can function as wildlife crossings. There's some bridges over rivers and things like that. So the fencing, you know, it wasn't put in in this like comprehensive thought of like, how do we create, improve highway permeability for wildlife and reduce collisions? It was really focused on the collision reduction side of that equation. So um, I think it just increased the barrier effect from the wildlife standpoint. <laughs> Do you have any um, data on what the relative cost of an underpass versus an overpass? And since what, some are more effective for different animals, would you then choose one over the other in, in specific areas? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we definitely design around the, the species that are in the area. So we're, that's a huge factor in it is that, you know, we want we want to build, if we're going to invest in this, we want them to be effective for those wildlife. So absolutely designing around those species. Um, so, you know, where we have elk or bighorn sheep, those are, you know, how we have to think about those species. Um, deer are relatively easy, um, all things considered. So, so that is a big piece of the equation. And with regards to the cost part of your question, um, generally, underpasses are cheaper, and so, for example, on Highway 9, the and this was 2015, times have changed, 
Um, but it, back then, the underpasses were just over a million and the overpasses were just over two million. Um, and it depends on so many factors, though. You're also looking at the terrain. Sometimes it just makes sense that to have an overpass. Sometimes it makes sense to put an underpass. So there's a lot of factors that go into that cost as well, but just as a rough guide. Question. Um, I, I also wanted to clarify that I see the mission of Roaring Fork Safe Passages in the long run as being one that uses some of the, the low hanging fruit that we have in the valley. So optimizing the fencing here, ensuring that we have better repairs on fencing when it comes down, um, ensuring that the places where animals are getting out into the freeway where the fencing is down, like ensuring that they can't get out because there's cattle guards. So this isn't, it is about the, the crossings and like that's the ultimate goal, but I also see uh, Roaring Fork Safe Passages having a, a longer term uh, presence in the valley to ensure that we're also using all the tools that are available. Some of those are gonna be significantly cheaper. Okay. Is, uh, your organization, is it a 501c3? So Watershed Biodiversity Initiative is a 501c3, and they're fiscally sponsoring us. So they receive the funding, uh, and it directly goes to this organization. Yeah. Uh, can you speak to the effectiveness of the openings in the fences with the ramps that we see all over the place? So um, the escape ramps, some people come like escape ramps or jump outs. The purpose of those is where we have wildlife fencing, inevitably some animals get trapped in that fence sometime. There's a hole in the fence or somehow they breach it. So the ramps provide a way for animals to get back to the habitat side of the fence. So the idea is first they have to find the ramp and then they um, you know, have to get to the top and jump down. So um, they, they're not perfect, <laughs> um, but we have, we have studied them. They've, they've been a part of several studies of my studies and also a few other colleagues in, in Arizona and other locations. And, you know, we're learning more about, like, how high the ramp could be, because the, the wildlife fence is eight feet tall and to prevent animals from, you know, crossing. But the ramps have to be tall or not too tall because we want animals to jump down. If it's too tall, then they're going to not jump down because they don't want to. Um, but if it's too short, then they can jump from the opposite side. So there's this balance there. And then you have to think about all the species in the landscape. You know, like uh, a bighorn sheep can scale something that a deer can't scale. So there's a lot of those issues. Um, and we're, we're doing better, <laughs> but it, they're not perfect, but they do help in getting animals when they are in the, the fence right away, get them out to the other side. So um, I, I, you know, I think we're always looking for how we can mitigate better and have better options for doing that. You might have noticed um, on some of the older fencing uh, and on I-70, but also in other locations, we used to see there were one-way gates and they were um, sized differently. And the idea, and they kind of had these bars that sometimes got stuck open and things like that. But the idea was that um, you know animals could, if they were in the right of way, that they could use those gates and push through and not come back the other direction. Well, there was a lot of problems with those, and they don't work that well, and we stopped using those. And so the ramps have taken their place. I'm hoping someday some other, somebody's going to come up with a brilliant idea, and we can you know, replace the ramps with something even better. But right now, it's the best tool we got. What role can seasonal trail closures play in reducing wildlife vehicle collisions? Ooh. The question was, what role can seasonal wild or uh, seasonal trail conditions um, play in reducing wildlife vehicle collisions? Um, wow, uh, I think that's going to be a big. It depends on where that is and what kind of habitat you're in and things like that. So I don't know if I can specifically answer your question, but I can say that when we're thinking about crossing structures and making these huge multi-million-dollar <laughs> investments that we want to think about things like what is the recreation use. So not only the development, we talked about that. You don't want to have development on the other side of the crossing structure. We also don't really like people using our crossing structures. They're more, we know they're more effective when human use and um, wildlife use is separated. So the other piece of that, though, gets to 
um, just trail use. And so when, tra when wildlife and um, human recreation is in the same landscape, especially right around a crossing structure or in any kind of critical habitat, but you want those animals to have access to the structure and feel free to use them. So if people are recreating right around the structure, then you know, that would be an issue. And so I guess circle back around to your question, I would say the more effective the crossing structure, the more we can reduce those collisions. With the significant cost of these overpasses and underpasses, where does the automobile insurance company figure in here? Not very much, um, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, they have, we've approached insurance companies many times over the years, and, um, and I can't really do this justice, but I have had it explained to me by a, somebody who is like deep in the insurance world. Um, they're, they're not really incentivized to, to do anything, to put real dollars to it. What I've seen is that the insurance companies, you know, they might support some kind of just general education and outreach efforts, but they haven't put like real dollars towards actual crossing structures. I would, um, State Farm, they do produce uh, reports of wildlife vehicle collisions for every state. And so, and then they rank the states across the nation of who has the most collisions. And West Virginia is usually way up there with all their white-tailed deer. Um, and, and they do, you know, some outreach and kind of just, um, you know, media and press releases around that. But, um, and I think State Farm, they actually did fund a study, like a prioritization study in another state. But yeah, we haven't seen the insurance companies step up. Yeah. Federal government going to require that because they really benefit from this as well. I was just curious. They also benefit. I mean, this is going to sound cynical. They also benefit from collisions. <laughs> so um, you know, I don't. I don't see that happening. I mean, I'm. That's way out of my wheelhouse. Um, but I think the federal government is doing a lot of other things to address the issue, not just of wildlife vehicle collisions, but actually thinking about connectivity for wildlife. And so through a lot of the different agencies and funding programs. For the nation. So that's a, that, that, there's 750 million here in Colorado, but that's a, that's a high number. So, so we've spoken about new technology and old technology. At the base of the county road we live on, at, where it meets 82, there's cattle guard, deer guard. What's the effect, eff, efficacy of those? Sorry for mispronouncing that, but how do they work? Yeah, well, there's um, different designs, and so it's also kind of part of a whole mitigation system, just like the fencing and the escape ramps. So, um, you know, the ramps allow animals that are trapped in the fence to get out. The, the guards are designed to prevent animals from getting out into the right away in the first place. So if those guards are working well, we're gonna have fewer, fewer animals that can get into the fenced area. Um, so that also depends on the design of those guards. Um, and there's been a lot of evolution in that design and we're kind of learning better what works um, and what works for different species also. So again, it, it comes down to knowing what species you're dealing with in an area. Um, some of the old designs that were literally a double, double cattle guard um, animal. And then, so it's kind of like you have one eight foot concrete guard, um, you know, or framed guard and they could jump from the middle and then jump across. So we were like, okay, double category is not the way to go. Let's just make it one continuous thing so they can't do that hop. Um, we've also learned uh, on Highway 9, we were able to have round bar guards versus flat bar guards. And we were able to look at those and we found that um, the round bar guards had two advantages. One was that they, you tended not to be able to get the snow plowed as much into them because when you plow snow into a guard, it becomes a flat surface and animals walk across it. So the flat bar guards had that problem where the round bar guards were a little bit better with that. And the round bars, you know, like animals like deer and elk, they have hooves. So they tended to repel um, more frequently from that guard. Um, animals like 
that have paws, so your bears and your mountain lions and things like that, they can walk across anything, really. <laughs> they could even climb the fence if they want to. But the good news is when they learn those crossing structure locations, um, they like the path of least resistance too, and they use those. So um, it really depends on the design of those guards, and we're also trying to make those more effective. But you know, some of the other considerations come into like, um, people walking across it and how safe they feel and motorcycles and bicycles and that kind of thing. We probably only have time for one more question. We're right around seven. Oh my gosh. I see, yeah, I was like. <laughs> Don't worry, they'll be sticking around after to ask them. <laughs> Which animals in our valley um, need to be protected the most? Where, where do we have the most problems? Um, as far as which animals? The, this is actually, I wish Tom Cardamon was up here to, to speak to this question, but I would say that from my knowledge, the the elk population is is suffering the worst. Yeah. And is there a problem with the moose population that's I think that, you know, I, I'm so sorry. I'm not the... <laughs> Not the wildlife biologist, um, but I I think that population is it, to an extent coming back, which is really exciting. From in my lifetime, I remember as a kid, I never saw moose. Um, but that being said, we've had some really horrific crashes with them. So I would say it's a it's a horrible shame to see any hit by cars uh, as that population comes back. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> All right, thanks so much for all the great questions, folks. Uh, please stop by our table on the way out. I really encourage all of you to come and sign up for the Roaring Fork Safe Passes email list. My Forker Grant's going to mail it. Away. Yes, it's holding it up for me. Um, so you can get involved and learn more about ways to take action to help prevent these things in the valley. Uh, you can also learn a little bit more about the organizations involved with natural science, like wilderness workshop and cases. Thank you all so much for coming and our next panel.